Welcome to the Red Bull Theater Podcast, where guests discuss all things classical theater with your host, Nathan Winkelstein. Welcome to the Red Bull Theater Podcast. I'm so thrilled to welcome today the award-winning theater, television, and film actress, perhaps best known for her roles on Broadway in Eclipsed, Venus, Schoolgirls, and more, but best known in classical theater circles as the first Black woman to play Hamlet, which she did to great acclaim at the Wilma Theater in 2015 in a production directed by Blanka Zizka. She is the ineffable... Zainab Ja. Hi, Zainab. How are you? I'm good, thank you. Hi, Nathan. Thank you so much for joining for for this Red Bull Theater podcast um, and for being a guest. Thank you for having me. I'm glad to be here. So as our listeners know, and as you know, we often start these with a small piece of text from the play that we're going to discuss. Mm -hmm. And uh, you have kindly offered to read a just mildly famous piece from Hamlet, the What a Piece of Work is a Man speech from Act 2, Scene 2, if you're following along at home, where Hamlet is speaking to Rosencrantz and Guildenstern. And if you're ready, let's just jump right in. I will tell you why. So shall my anticipation prevent your discovery and your secrecy to the king and queen, moat no feather. I have of late, but wherefore I know not, lost all my mirth, forgone all custom of exercises and Indeed, it goes so heavily with my disposition that this goodly frame, the earth, seems to me a sterile promontory. This most excellent canopy, the air, but look you, this brave o'erhanging firmament, this majestical roof fretted with golden fire, why it appears no other thing to me than a foul and pestilent congregation of vapors. What a piece of work is a man. How noble in reason, how infinite in faculty, in form and moving, how express and admirable in action, how like an angel in apprehension, how like a god, the beauty of the world, the paragon of animals. And yet to me, what is this quintessence of dust? Man delights not me, no, nor woman neither, though by your smiling you seem to say so. Thank you. That was wonderful. I have to ask right off, you know, when I asked you what speech you were interested in doing for this podcast, I was sort of anticipating one of the seven immensely famous soliloquies. I mean, yes. Yeah. And and yet you 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 went very quickly to this speech. Why does this speech in particular speak to you as someone who's performed this role? You know, it's I've never been able to put my finger on why this speech be out of like you say, the many, many famous speeches in this play, but it, for some reason I'm always drawn to this one just just the fact that, you know, he's, Hamlet is just so aware of the m- magnificence of the world we inhabit, and yet it just underlines and reinstates the confusion, the dis- the dislocation and turmoil he's going through inside in that, why, why, why is it I cannot find a place? Why can't I find my footing? I have everything I need. And it's just, I mean, I guess it just spoke to me 
my state at the time when I was doing the play, because I felt very, you know, sort of on shaky ground. It was one, it's, and I think I'll always, if I ever get to the opportunity to do this again, I think I will always feel that way. And for some reason, that's the one my my intuition and my soul goes to. So that's that's my short, not very smart answer, but it's mainly, <laughs> that's where it comes from for me. That's that's great. I mean, the the insight of him of or of this character of Hamlet feeling on shaky ground, like mm -hmm. recognizing the beauty of of everything around him and yet feeling outside of it. I mean, you say that you you felt like you were on shaky ground when you were doing this role. Was that because Hamlet is the, <laughs> one of the most intimidating roles on the planet or was was being such a trailblazer in your performance of this role part of that? Where Can you explain more about what you were thinking there? I think it was all of the above, everything you said. It was the fact that it's one of my favorite Shakespeare plays. It's also one of the, you know, the quintessence show, the, the Mount Everest of it. And I know so many people have tried and so, you know, people have, many, many people have attempted that climb. And also the fact that, you know, I'm a, I'm a black woman and, um, and I was very much, I remember when Blanca, asked me and she kept calling me and asking me and I kept saying no all the like for months and months and months I would say no and every and she, at one point she just said to me every reason you're giving me for not doing it is the reason why you should do it <laughs> but my main reason for I my main resistance that I kept saying is like in case you haven't noticed I'm an African woman and then Hamlet has this line that says "Tis I Hamlet the Dane I'm like I don't know if I'll be able to say that you know and believe it because it's like, yeah, but, you know, on the outside, that's not what you're seeing. And yet I so want to do it. I, I was just so torn. And so that was my reason for feeling very much like on on um, unstable, shaky ground. And like on the one hand, wanting to really do this. On the other hand, being so intimidated and scared for all the other reasons I kept giving myself to feel that way. And do you mind me asking how that, if not resolved, how that manifested in the process? I mean, this is a conversation that's still ongoing about race and, and this idea of color blindness or color awareness or gender blindness or gender awareness in performing Shakespeare. I mean, how how did you reconcile the, the deep honesty required to engage in a character like Hamlet and feeling like maybe there was a, a juxtaposition between saying a line like, I am Hamlet the Dane and being an African woman, like how in the room did that manifest? Hmm. Well, definitely the support of the cast and the director, that was the first thing. They really, they, I never felt, I was never made to feel othered in any way, it was a case of like, because we all come from that classical background, we all know Shakespeare, we all, we're all very used to seeing, you know, men playing women, women playing men, vice versa, different races. So within that family, that bubble of theater, I felt accepted and welcomed. And I think my main worry was, at the time was worrying what the audience would, would think. It wasn't my peers I worried about. It was what the audience would feel and think. And then, it's, you know, and it's still really, I just entered into it as Hamlet, the person, you know, the person dealing with familial dysfunction, the person dealing with, you know, youth and confusion. Ham I played Hamlet, the person, not male, not female, just Hamlet, the person, you know what I mean? The human being. And that was my, that was what guided me. And then... As the performances, as we opened and we, from the first performance, just the, the, this unspoken acceptance I got from the audience is something that kept building and growing for me, especially the student matinees, which was really interesting because we would have these Q and A's and it was always the teachers who would ask the students how they felt seeing me, Zainab, playing Hamlet. And, 99.9% .9 of the time they were like, they didn't see, they saw Hamlet, they saw themselves in Hamlet, no matter what race or color they, or um, gender they were, they just saw Hamlet as themselves, which is what 
we, I saw Hamlet as when I first read it at school at the age of 13. You know, I didn't think Hamlet the Dane. I just thought Hamlet, oh my God, I'm a student. I'm like, I'm going through all of these questions in my life about what does it mean, to, you know, to be or not to be. You know, these are like questions that I'm, we're all asking ourselves as we're growing and developing into adults. And these students really were the ones who like basically took my hand and said, you have nothing to worry about. That's fascinating. That's fascinating. I mean, I, I've often heard that the student matinees, they, they're more open to just receiving the story. Yeah. And, and they, they let us know these architectures we've built up are mm -hmm. really there. They're yeah. just in our minds. What do you think, this is a mildly intense question, I guess. So bear with me. Okay. What in, in today's theater world, I think, and well, and today's social and cultural world, we're very interested and we're very focused on identity and making sure that um, representation, not just across the board, but in specific roles is taken care of very carefully. Um, and who, who really should be playing various roles uh, throughout both the classical canon and contemporary canon. What is it, do you think, about Shakespeare in general or even classical theater in general and what and specifically about Hamlet that seems to allow really anybody anybody's identity to exist inside that role? What what do you have any thoughts on why we are able to embrace any semiotics that we see when it comes to these roles and embrace any human experience inside them is I mean at the risk of sounding cliched and saying what has always been said I think what it is that appeals to us and allows us to embrace the otherness of various people is the of various characters it's like the universe the universality of the human condition that Shakespeare has written and that appeals to us, you know, as, hum as, a, as humanity. You know, there's a reason why you can see a Japanese version of King of Macbeth and it's still, you know, it, it, it appeals to a wide and disparate group of people because of the fact that at, the, at its core, it is about the human condition and, you know, we, we, the same struggles we all go through and face in terms of love, death, you know, war. We've all been through that. We've all been touched by that. We've all been affected by that. And I really think that's what it is that makes it so appealing to people to be able to look past gender and class and race and say, you know, you can... Uh, you can embrace this. It's so interesting when you say that. Like, for instance, when I saw um, Othello at the New York Theatre Workshop a few years ago with David Oyelowo and Daniel Craig, and it was amazing to me. Daniel Craig played Iago like a common working class man who you'd meet down a pub in, in somewhere in Liverpool or Newcastle. He was so just run-of-the-mill working class. And I love that because... You know, it doesn't have to be he's from some high class. It's like, what is his what is his conflict? What is he what does he want? You know, because we all no matter where you are in life or where you come from, you all have we all want the same things, which is power, acknowledgement, love, money, whatever it is. But it's like those things transcend race and creed and gender, you know. Yeah, that's no, I think that's um beautifully said. And I am, I'm glad you feel that way and felt that way doing, doing Hamlet, because it's certainly something that I have felt in, in reading and studying that role of, at the end of the day, that character's, the thing that makes that character, that character, yeah, sure, are they technically a Dane? Are they technically a he? Are they technically yeah. a prince? Yes. But the, what, what makes their dramatic journey, what is their turbulent journey, is mm -hmm. wrestling with the nature of life. Yeah. And, you know, and especially that to be or not to be speech 
that to be or not to be. I love how I just referred to it that way. And the who would bear that list of things, the whips of yeah, time. Yeah, it's being so and, and, a religious fortune, yeah. yeah. And you hear those things and you go, that's, everybody has their version of that. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and that version can be different, but that they all can exist inside this one person. And in fact, the fact that so many different people can do this role means it defies the definitive version. We can always explore it. Exactly. It's like I don't have to play Hamlet as a black woman. I just have to be Hamlet, the, the person that it, embodying the, the, the inner conflicts and turmoil. It was like another thing I noticed whenever I would walk on stage, especially when those big seminal speeches would come up. And I noticed this, especially again with this, the student audience, they would literally be mouthing the words. And I'm looking across, it's a sea of faces from every race and walk of life. And it's like something about those words has appealed to that, these people individually so deeply that they have memorized it and they, they're saying it because it means something to them. You know what I mean? And it was like, wow, this is how powerful this is. They, this is why they can get past the outside because I walk out, you know, no matter what I do, I don't have to do anything. I am a political statement if I'm coming out to play Hamlet and looking like this. And so, and they're aware of that, but they're able to look past it, you know? And it's like, of course, it's a, it's the, the, um, it speaks to the amazing writing that was a, that's able to like reach into the soul of the onlooker and the listener and the reader and the person who's embodying that character. And well, yeah, I mean, <laughs> It's Hamlet at his absolute finest, I think. And I forget who, and I apologize to whichever scholar I'm stealing this from, but some scholar spoke about how Shakespeare's kind of fundamental ability with language was to describe the indescribable, is that he's able to use imagery. A lot of his contemporaries would use imagery to look outward, to describe something outside of themselves, Mm -hmm. whereas Shakespeare at his best uses imagery as a way to help explore and describe the indescribable. If that's Juliet discovering what love is on the balcony, or if that's Hamlet trying to describe what it is to exist in life when you, when you really don't want to anymore, that there's something about that language that kind of when done correctly drives to the core of the human experience. And, and to that question, I guess you, you mentioned that you were on, you felt like you were on uneven footing when mm-hmm. you were doing Hamlet. I imagine that's a, uh, a universal feeling for actors playing Hamlet. Whew. This is such a general question, but maybe we'll hone down from it. What do you think at its core is the greatest challenge of playing this character? For me, the challenge in, I didn't, I wasn't fully aware of the ex, you know, the ex, the, you know, the challenge in like, just how challenging it would be until I started, until I stood, I got into the rehearsal room. I had an inkling and, but uh, I think it's the roller coaster of emotions that, that this Hamlet goes through. I remembered feeling battered, tossed and turned at every, at the end of every performance, just physically and emotionally ex- exhausted because the highs are so high and the lows are so low. And it's like, I was just m- mentally and emotionally and psychically. I remember when I finished the run and when some people would ask me, so what are you doing next? I said, I have nothing left, you know, because I've just done this and I, I'm like, I, this, I'm, I'm done. I am wiped and there's nothing else. And I think I'll just go and take a few years off and wait until King, I'm ready to play King Lear. <laughs> <laughs> I remembered and then, I mean, I, you had an inkling of it because you've heard, you've heard uh, so many other actors who've done it talk about it and say what a, a challenge it would be. I remember I did this reading at Symphony Space and I think it was with, what's his name, Michael Stuhlberg, I think his name is. And he had played Hamlet. <clears throat> And we were doing this reading together and he asked me in conversation backstage, what are you doing next? And I said, well, I'm going to do Hamlet next and I'm terrified and all that stuff. And he told me about how he felt when he was approaching it and the the terror he felt and the the challenge. 
you know, I think my in my case it was ignorance is bliss. I wasn't as terrified as he said he said because he'd already played it. I think maybe at Juilliard he like touched on it, you know, in front of an audience, whereas I hadn't. I'd just read it and been in school. And then he told me, I said, so how were you able to, um, you know, overcome this this fear? And he said, interestingly enough, he'd been doing something. I forget what. But he got he ended up in a conversation with Mark Rylance. And Mark Rylance sent him this letter telling him, you know, how he approached Hamlet. And essentially boiled down to saying, which is where I got the um, idea for It's an Everest. He said, it's like climbing, climbing Mount Everest. You just put one foot in front of the other. And you just keep going. You just keep climbing. And Michael was sweet enough to, he actually sent, gave me that copy that Mark Rylance gave him you know, which I had in my dressing room mirror every night. So I read that every night before I got just like, just one foot in front of the other. Don't, you know, don't like stand at the foot of the mountain and look up and go like, oh my God, it's so far to climb. Just, just start climbing. Just start climbing. <laughs> I do think it's so interesting. We actually had Stuhlbarg on a podcast a little while ago talking about Angelo in, in Measure for Measure. But it is interesting. So... What I've heard and thought about when, when working on Hamlet, and I have to be open and honest here and admit that I have also played the role, so I have some sense of this, is that one of the very particular challenges of Hamlet is it's such a prototypical role. It's a role that everybody's like, oh, you're doing your Hamlet. Here we go. This is how we know if you're a great actor somehow. Yes. And yet the role itself and the person themselves is so flawed and is so vulnerable and so not really heroic in the classical sense that the the juxtaposition of that of like here I go out on stage to do this role that everyone wants me to be great in but in order to be great I have to be such a mess is strikes me as a very particular challenge for an actor was that something that you faced in doing it? Absolutely. Absolutely. I felt that, you know, the, the idea of when you're doing your Hamlet, it's like you're doing this, it's like you've reached some zenith in your career and you're just slick and perfect and all that. And I think, I actually think the, the <laughs> that is the, the what people, ex I don't know, that is the, the, the expectation. But I, for me, I find there's something much more authentic and real and touching about someone who is actually in the early part of their career where you're like, you know, you're still finding how you do these things, how you move, you're finding your footing as it were. And I think allowing that vulnerability and that unsuredness is actually makes it much more authentic to me. When I see a Hamlet that's very polished and slick and, seems to know all the answers and it's like saying all the words perfectly it actually doesn't move me because i'm like oh you it's like no it's an it becomes an academic exercise as opposed to right. you know me sitting there watching a real person you know make a mess stumble and fall and get up and try again because that's what it is you make a mess you stumble you fall you get up and try again and you just keep going until you come to a resolution <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? And so I definitely explored, I experienced that sense of, um, I'm a flaw, I'm like, I'm flawed. I used the fact, I used everything that is in my background. I have not, I don't have traditional acting training. I didn't go to an acting, a drama school. I went to ballet school. My background, my training is dance. It's ballet and modern. That's my, co that was my um, conservatory in England. So that fear there is that's something I use. I'm like, I literally don't know what the fuck I'm doing right now. I but I do know one thing I can do to help myself. One thing I do have is the discipline to like the day I set foot into rehearsal room, I am off book. I know the words. So I don't have to have that one more thing getting in my way. Let me just know what what I'm going in to say. And and that's my dance training. It's like get in there warmed up and prepared. That's yeah. really interesting. It's really interesting to me that you come from a background in, in dance because I think dance and music have some interesting parallels with Shakespeare in that there is technique mm. 
Mm -hmm. in, there, there is technique that is considered, if not absolutely mandatory, pretty darn close. Yeah. There is technique inside the verse structure. There's technique, obviously, inside ballet, inside doing music, et cetera. But inside that, te that technique gives you freedom. Yes. And when you're on stage, you're not thinking about your technique. You're thinking about mm -hmm. the story you're telling, the piece of music, that what the piece of music is expressing. And did you, do you find that transference of how, how technical are you with Shakespeare's like text and verse work, for example? Um, extremely technical, just because I've been fortunate enough to be in a lot of productions, a lot of classical productions with people who have ex excellent training. I am a magpie. I'm a thief. I learned, my training came from being on stage with people who have amazing technique and training and seeing what it does for them. And so, yes, absolutely. I'm very, I'm like brutally efficient with my, my vocal warmups, my everything, my, I, I do a, like, I literally break into a sweat an hour before we even start, because that's just, I know that strength and, um, Stability I feel in the world in, when I'm in a dance situation, when I've done all the physical stuff, when I've done all my technical work, then I, I know what that feels like. I know what that feels like, you know, so I apply it definitely to theater, to acting. Just I do myself, I arm myself with all the things I need so I can find what I'm trying to find on stage when I'm speaking uh, you know, the word, speaking the speech, like being there, technique is definitely there, but I also don't let it bog me down to the point where I become a machine, you know, or become a robot. It's like, I, it took me years, but it, it's allowed me to, um, I embrace my flaws and my faults. I embrace the fact that, you know, I don't know everything. I don't have a, a background of, um, a conservative classical acting training because I feel it allows me to speak naturally sometimes because the danger sometimes with people I find is especially when it comes to Shakespeare they start speaking like everyone's a fucking king or a queen and they forget to just be just speak as a person you know so we can understand it's like it's not um a recitation it's not a recitation yeah that's I love that because I do think it's a through line I've seen amidst the guests that I've had on here, mm -hmm. this idea of some of the most technical verse actors you can possibly imagine, right? Like Dakin Matthews, Patrick yeah. Page, Hamish Linklater, Chuck Woody Awuji, like incredibly technical actors. Mm -hmm. But that the technique, like dance, the technique is only utilized to prepare yourself to discover the truth, to open the text. It's never used as a, now I'm just going to follow this set of rules and therefore I am doing good Shakespeare. That That's seems to be something that everyone avoids. Exactly, like, like exactly. Speaking of Chuck Chuk Woody, um, I first saw him, I think it was Tamburlaine and at New York at Theatre for a New Audience. And I remember thinking, exactly, like I remembered whenever I see, for me, whenever I see what is to me is good Shakespeare done well, I always think of it as dance. It's like my first, I always al allude to it as like watching a great ballet. It's like the technique is so, it's there, but it allows you to see the humanity, the characters, the person underneath it. I'm not seeing, you know, how you're saying the words. I'm seeing, I'm feeling the person. I, I certainly, of course, with John Douglas and Chukudi, I, I certainly, whenever I look at them, I think, yes, it's like ballet to me. It's like ballet to me. It's just, it's like music to me. That te the technique is undeniable, and, but that's not what I'm looking at. That's not what I'm, I'm feeling. That's, that's great. I, and I think somewhere in there, if there was one thing that I hope that people get out of this podcast to some extent is that not just Shakespeare, but all forms of art are based in a foundation of technique mm -hmm. that then allows a freedom of expression mm -hmm. and that it is technique without freedom of expression is not helpful. 
No. And freedom of expression without technique is you might be able to get the right take in a movie if you only need to get the take once. Exactly. But but if you're doing it seven or eight times a week, if you're trying to create something that is honest and repeatable, you must have that that structure. You must know how to fish, not just find a fish. Exactly. Right? And so that's it's really exciting to hear you kind of draw those parallels. And, and that's why I love being on the stage. That's why I love being on stage with you know some of the people we mentioned because it's like it's my it's the best training for me is to be there like right there breathing with them hearing them like feeling them their their body heat you know everything the how their eyes are affected by what they're saying and therefore thinking to me it's it's like you know being in the belly of the beast as it were you know to and and I feel so lucky that I've been able to do that. And um, you know, it's it's just as valuable as being in a conservatory. You know, learning your, you know, the nuts and bolts. Right, right. Yeah, you know, just hearing you talk. Maybe it was the passion with which you were doing it. It was just reminding me of you of you doing the speech at the top of this podcast, and that that this speech is actually somewhat about. Bear with me here, but like the technique without the expression of like he knows what a what a beautiful thing a human being is, all of these incredible gifts that humanity has. And yet at this moment, he can only see the bones and the skin mm -hmm. and the texture. He can't have this freedom of expression. He can't have this dream of, of being human or this dream of the heavens. He just sees a sterile promontory and earth, a, a, a body. And there's, there's just something interesting about where this conversation has gone and why, mm -hmm. you, why you chose this piece yeah. and why it speaks to you that I find fascinating. Yeah, it's like he's right in this place. He's in a place where he's just seeing the abstract. He's seen everything in the abstract. You know, it's not seeing it as like... Uh, the meats and potatoes level, the visceral blood and guts level, it's just like stuff, you know, like uh, stuff like a, a coating, a superficial coating on stuff. And he's like, he doesn't know how to get behind to see, yeah. the, you know, the facade. Yeah, so what I have to add, you know, normally anyone who's listening to the podcast would know, normally I would be digging into the specific speech. And I have so many questions about where Hamlet's at in the play at this time, because he's such an unreliable narrator right now, because yeah. he's doing the antic disposition. He doesn't really trust Rosencrantz and Guildenstern, but then he does the super vulnerable thing. There's lots of questions there. But I have to ask, given your background, what, what was it that made you shift from dance to theater and more specifically from dance what what made you find and fall in love with classical theater? What what was that journey? Well, my journey starts with um, I was born under a full moon. No, <laughs> <laughs> no, my journey starts with um, I I spent my childhood in West Africa. My parents were in medical school in England, and so they sent me to Sierra Leone when I was like six months old, and I was raised with my grandmother who had a children's theater company, and she also taught English literature. So basically the first play, once I could read, like I read my first play when I was like seven or eight years old, I read The Merchant of Venice. I didn't understand what Whoa. I was saying. <laughs> I literally, I just was fascinated. She had all these Shakespeare books lying around. So I just was fascinated by this language. What is this weird language? And, and my grandmother is like, at the time, Sierra Leone was a British colony or coming out of the British colonial era. So there's there's certain there's certain um, people in this, in the culture, and especially the older people, the elders. They spoke in a very old school British way. They all sounded like bloody Downton Abbey. It was very very posh, and especially in the capital of Freetown. And my grandmother taught literature, and you know people spoke English at school and all that. And and so I was fascinated by the words because there were always books. I didn't watch TV until I was like ten or eleven years old. All I did was read books. And so that fascination was always there. And then fast forward to me moving to England when I was like 10 and around 16 or 17, I decided to be a rebellious immigrant's daughter by not going to medical school and saying, I'm going to be a dancer instead. And they were all, you know, pissed off about that, which was like, yes, I want to get away. <laughs> 
And then I ended up sticking with dance because it was like, oh, this is fun. I didn't mean to stay. But and then one day I just woke up one day and I said, I think I'm ready to speak. You know, because my grandmother put me in it on stage when I was like, could speak and walk and all that in children's theater company. But that wasn't my choice. And then somehow in the middle of my dance career, I just realized one day I'm not being challenged and I wanted to speak. And so I just basically just threw myself into auditioning, taking classes here and there. And I found myself, it was really interesting. I found that, because I had a very British accent, very sort of the, the type of accent, people just assumed I'd been to drama school. And so they would just put me in these plays, just assuming I knew what I was doing. <laughs> <laughs> so like when I first started acting, my the first five years, my resume literally looked like Shakespeare and Euripides and Sophocles. It was all classical, which is great because that's where I got to meet all these actors like John Douglas Thompson, like Andre de Shields. Like I got to meet them in my infancy as an actor because I would get in, you know, because I don't know of my enthusiasm and I could speak the speech as though I knew what I was saying, but I just had really good diction. <laughs> and I learned from being and that's you know it was so much more challenging for me when I decided to move into acting and the bigger the challenge the more I felt like I really want to do this because I just love getting underneath the skin of these you know because people have been giving me work because of how I sound but I like Hamlet I unlike Hamlet I want to get underneath the facade of this the pretty speech and what is underneath there? What is the meat and bones under there? What are the guts? What's, where's the blood? And, and so that for me is what kept me there. And, um, you know, in, from the initial moment of wanting to dip my toe in and try it to the point, to the fact that now I'm just there and I've had the opportunity to work with all these amazing people to learn and steal and take and, you know, like a succubi, just absorb, you know, the, the passion for not just words, but the passion for excavating those characters. I mean, I've, I've had the opportunity of doing Hamlet three times. I've been Ophelia, I've been Horatio, and I've been Hamlet. And I'm like, you know, I'm waiting. When am I going to be Polonius? <laughs> <laughs> I think Gertrude might be on the list too at some point. Oh, yes. Gertrude is definitely on my bucket list. Absolutely. Yeah. And though it's interesting that you chose Polonius first, another fascinating character in this book. Well, ever since I did Hamlet, I feel like the male characters are so much more exciting and interesting to me. You know, I don't know what it is. I felt like I remember thinking when I first did Hamlet, I thought, oh, this is what male actors get to go through because this roller coaster, this is what they get to, this is, this is the, they get to ride this horse. Oh my God. I, I just, that's all I want to do is play the male roles. Wow. I mean, <laughs> wow, it's like, I understand why you wrote it the way you did, Shakespeare. You are male, after all. It's like, you can only write from experience. Uh, boy, I want to like, I want to get on that horse again because it was so much more. It just goes, it's like a wild horse just bolts away from you and you have to just hold on. Yeah. Well, and also to be slightly fair to him, his women were being played by 15-year-old boys. Exactly. So he, he had to be a little exactly. careful about what he gave them. Exactly. I mean, it's, a, it's one of those fun things. Again, I'm going to, I am a practitioner, not a scholar, but like you can tell when you look at his canon, you can tell when a, when he got a really talented boy. Yes. Because he got a really talented one near the end of his writing. And that's when you get Lady M, Cleopatra, um, Desdemona, you yes. get all of these you get many of the most intense female characters yes. near the end of the canon because he's got someone who can do them exactly. um, yeah the, absolutely yeah i feel like yeah i'm not as completely eschewing the ever playing another female role in class in shakespeare i definitely i'm looking i have my have my bucket list like i say of female roles i want to play but i really thoroughly enjoyed hamlet the physicality of Hamlet, just not in the physicality of the language, the physicality, the muscularity of the emotions, all of that, because I'm a, I, it just really appealed to me and it sat well on me just because I'm a, such a physical actor and I'm very, I'm just, I, I run all over this place when I'm on stage and Hamlet allowed me to do that in terms of just being tempest tossed with emotion, you know. 
And also Where that big fencing scene, the sword fight at the end is like everything for me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's, I, I, I buy that. Always love a good combat scene. Um, oh, absolutely. It was one of my favorite moments because I'd actually competed in fencing at school in England. And so when the fight director found that out, it, suddenly my, that fight scene turned into an extra, a whole new act. <laughs> That's what it should be. We've we've earned the audience has sat there for two and a half hours while, yes. like, getting so much drama and they're tired and like give them yes. a fun sword fight at the end. Exactly. The, they they've earned it. You've earned it. The let me ask, just because you you're talking about the tempest tossing of the character itself, and this speech does fall under a very particular part. How did you manage the antic disposition part of his journey it's a part that i know is very traditional for that era of theater but it's still it's always struck me as as complicated from a kind of motivational perspective of like i just found out my dad's been murdered i'm gonna act crazy for a bit and also that to be or not to be falls inside the antic disposition, but is also a soliloquy. I'm just curious how you tackled the challenge of the anticness. Ah, oh, God, let me write, try and remember. I was going to say it's been 10 years. <laughs> I mean, it's one of those things where it was such an icky, awkward, catchy, trying to pulling and pull it, pushing, trying to find it, that it's still, you know, my I still get like itchy skin thinking about, uh, how do I do this? How do I do this? It's like, because I did, I certainly didn't want to walk around like, like acting crazy, whatever that means. So I think, I mean, if I re remember correctly, I just let what he said be the antic disposition in within the context of, where he was in terms of, you know, the situations he was, he finds himself in and how people were reacting to him and what they were saying about him. I think I just used that as opposed to like walking around being like vague and strange because I, I still don't, I'm not quite sure I even managed to quite pull it out for myself. Um, it was more a case of me just be choosing to believe that how they reacted to me, the people around me within the context of the play and within the context of the situation that Hamlet finds himself in, in I feel I, I think I was able to come to some sort of conclusion with it in that may they, what they're saying to me and about me I, I think I just used the words themselves of what he said. You know what I mean? Because it's one of those things where I always get taken out of the play when I see some when I see an actor about to do their antique disposition th thing. Yeah. I always think, oh, here we go. They're going to start like staring into walls and like stroking an unseen toenail in the air or something. <laughs> <laughs> and Fair. I didn't want to do that. You know what I mean? I didn't want to do that. So I let the words do that. I let the words do that. I let what was said about me do that. And I mean, I, I'm still not sure it was, I was successful at it. So, you know, it's, I, I do think, it's I think I may have blocked it off because it was such a, like, <laughs> <laughs> no, it, it makes sense to me. And it does. I, I think that following the words is always in Shakespeare, a smart decision because You've got a person who, for the first three scenes or four scenes of the play, it seems quite clearly depressed, right? Yeah. Like maybe maybe not clinically, but but depressed. Um, and then suddenly is given something to do, right? It goes from the kill to the murder, and he gets activated. Yeah, and his activation is he hides his activation in allowing himself to be a little flip, right? <laughs> allowing himself to to kind of tell people what they really are. And that that's, um, again, I'm forgetting the name of the other play, but the, the famous version of this character uses his I'm antic 
to, to be a truth teller, sort of like a yeah. fool in Shakespeare. And so I've always seen Hamlet's anticness as sometimes he's more antic than other times, like with Claudius in the play where he's really laying it on thick. Mm -hmm. But most of the time he's just using the opportunity to be a, almost a Shakespearean fool and tell you the truth. And so I, I was always interested in him just kind of playing with those words. That's what I think. I way. think the words gave the antic disposition. He's flipped. Okay, and he, like you say, he's a truth teller, and also he, the the the, sh the brevity, the shortness of his sentences, kind of activates you as an as the actor to it. It's like because the sentence is so much shorter and much more like to the point and clipped, it makes you say them faster. It makes you move faster. It, it, something about it, all of those things together galvanizes um, a forward movement, you know, and it changes your pace the pace of like, your thinking, the pace of your thinking, like that choosing to be a truth teller, it means you're like, you're, you're always on. You're always right. like looking for like, where's the truth here? Where's the truth here? Because that's a lie. Well, that's a lie. Well, that's a lie. It's like something has been activated in the brain, you know? And yes. so, and, and because of that, because you're in a society or oh, Hamlet is in a society where nobody really says what they really feel. Nobody really speaks the truth. It's like that in itself becomes an antic disposition because you're speaking truth now and nobody else is doing it. You right. know, and you're doing it really fast and you're, do you're not doing it without that. You're not cosseting any of the words. You're not like cosseting any of the people. There's no coddling. There's no saying it gently. It's just like truth to the, you know, sword to the gut kind of thing. And to me, that is what is the antic disposition, you know? Yes, and that, his brain it, is constantly thinking really, really fast and and like just like on, just turned on. That to me is what my interpretation of the antique disposition was. And isn't it interesting that the to be mad in a court is to tell the truth? Yeah, uh, is an interesting, and, and for a character who is so intensely honest in many ways with yeah. themselves and maybe a little less with the people around them, depending on the scene, but definitely with themselves, that his, his madness is this extreme drive of truth. And it, it allows him to spit some stuff. Like I think about it as we normally kind of think of the antic disposition element of the play ending at the play within the play. Yeah. But really it, it really continues until he leaves for England, which means it includes the chain, the the Gertrude scene. Yes. And now he's with his mother, which is going to be mm -hmm. different. But what he does in that scene is so is everything you just described, or at least when I read it and when I did it, I found this was that it has an immense driving pace to it, and it's just brutally honest from Hamlet's perspective. It's brutally honest in a way that he was never able to be, at yeah. least I think we could infer, mm -hmm. was never able to be before he took on this antic disposition. Like, I don't think, tell me if you disagree, I don't think he ever was able to be like, mom, the, these are all the terrible, these are all the reasons why it's a terrible idea to marry your your brother-in-law he mm -hmm. probably kind of closed in on himself yeah and now he gets to explode and so the antic disposition almost helps him there too it's an interesting yeah. way of thinking. it's like the, he becomes adrenalized by the fact that he can he, i think there's also the realization that oh i can say these things and like get away with it and just like they can't do anything i like I, it's like embracing your position in life in the courts and the, in the and saying oh and it's almost like oh he was drunk almost drunk with power in that what he can say and mm -hmm. get away with. And, and to the point where like culminating in that Gertrude scene where I think he just crosses the line there. He just got too, you know, there's a crossing of the episode like, oh shit, I enjoy, I'm enjoying that way too much. This is. Yeah, yeah. or whether it's enjoy enjoyment or not. I mean, that's a whole other podcast. But I've taken this scene. to another level. I've, I've taken this to but, another place that yes. I didn't anticipate. And it's like, ah. Uh, Okay. Well, I slaughtered somebody. Yeah. How like, do I get forget. back from this? It's like, yes. was that, that's not an antique disposition. That is something just happened. I just actually killed someone. Right. You know? 
And so there's a blurring of the lines there where it's like you, you know, it's like you've actually lost your mind. You know. Yes. Well, and I do think that this is there are there are many people, I think, who don't believe that it is debatable. They just Hamlet is saying the whole time. Mm hmm. The 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 chamber scene is the one scene where you kind of go, sure, but what exactly is sanity these days, right? Like, exactly. sure, he's not he's not crazy. He hasn't lost the perspective of where he is, mm -hmm. but it's 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 pretty wild what happens in that scene. And also, there's just the strangeness of the fact that the ghost shows up but is not visible to. Yeah. His mother, while the ghost was visible to other people earlier in the play, which is just a little odd. It's just yeah. an odd thing dramaturgically. Um, so, uh, which I think has to be solved in some ways. Yes. But yeah, it's very interesting. And I, I like that it's this idea of its honesty going back almost to this speech mm -hmm. where... Because I always wonder, like, is he being totally honest with them? But it sounds like what we're saying, because he doesn't trust them. He doesn't trust Rosicrats and Gillenstern. Yeah. But it sounds like what we're saying is that, yes, he's being totally honest because just by being crazy, he can actually express his truth. Yes. And then make it a, make it a homosexuality joke at the last second to cover his tracks. Yeah. Right, and, and he can just do that, which is, I, I think, a really interesting answer to a question I never got the opportunity to really ask, which is, <laughs> is Hamlet telling the truth in that scene? And I think what you're saying with this type of anticness is, yes, um, very which honest. Is what makes him, which is what makes him mad, as you said. It's like, because nobody else is doing that, so you are, right. the, you, are the, you are the square peg trying to get into a round hole or vice versa, and it's just like, it's not happening. You know, it's like, that's exactly. silly. That's just stupid and it's crazy and illogical. Illogical. <laughs> yes. It does, we, we shouldn't get into it now because it's another full podcast. It does make <laughs> me, it does make me want to ask about the get thee to a nunnery scene. Because oh, it's yeah. another scene that happens in the middle of the antic disposition section, which is mm -hmm. just so confusing at that scene. So. Yes. I really, I need to revisit Hamlet again and just really go back into my state you know, it would be interesting. It would be really, really interesting to revisit just to be like, ah, how, as you know, I'm 10 years older, you know, so how, how do I, how, what, what, how would I present it now? How would I feel? How would these things land in me? And how would they manifest? You know? Well, hey, that, that makes me happy because one of the other things I sneakily love about these podcasts is seeing actors remember roles they love doing and getting excited about them again. So, yeah. <laughs> right. um, well, I, I have taken quite a bit of your time um, and, and you have been so, so giving um, and open about your, your experience with this piece and your experience with theater. I'm, I'm so grateful. Thank um, you. Yes. And uh, do, are, you, are you up to anything in the coming months that people should know about? Yes, I'm going to be uh, directing a short film. Uh, that I just, uh, uh, it's based on a poem. It's just a little arty, little art exercise I'm doing for myself this summer. I'm like filming a poem that's an ode to New York. It's kind of almost like a, a, bla a leaves of grass. It's like almost like a Walt Whitman love to New York. And um, hopefully Andre de Shields is going to be my narrator. He's agreed. Oh, He's agreed. So let's hope I can get him while, while after Jellicoe, bald finishes Cats, yeah. but I saw it last week and he said yes I'd love to do it so and I love Andre I've done three plays with him and so I'm looking forward to that that's what I'm doing this summer and then trying to start a campaign for my short film which is doing the, I directed a short film that's doing the film festival run right now so it's a short film called Reunion so that's what I'm doing just wrapping up our festival run and about to start a campaign to get nominated for some big awards, hopefully, fingers crossed. And it's called Reunion? Yes. 
All right. Well, everybody who's listening, definitely check out the, the short film reunion with, once it becomes available to the public. Absolutely. And look for look for Zainab's work anywhere you can. It's it's always extraordinary. I've had the pleasure of working with her a couple of times now. And um, thanks, thanks, and ever thanks. Until yes. next time. Absolutely. Yes. Thank you. Thanks for tuning in to the Red Bull Theater Podcast. If you enjoyed this episode, please subscribe, rate, and leave a review on your favorite podcasting platform. Your support helps us to bring you more captivating conversations and insights into the world of classic theater. To stay updated on our latest activities, follow us on social media, get on our mailing list, and visit www.redbulltheater.com, where you'll find an abundance of podcasts, readings, classes, seminars, productions, and more. Your support makes all of this possible, so please consider making a tax-deductible donation on our website to help us continue bringing classical theater to contemporary audiences. Until next time, thanks, thanks, and ever thanks.